So Shireen is currently working with uh, Dr. Rosanna Olson, who we heard from earlier this semester, as well as Dr. Cheryl Grady at the University of Toronto. And today she'll be speaking with us about the structural and fu functional frontal parietal contributions to response inhibitions across the lifespan. So please join me in welcoming Shireen. Hi, thanks for, thanks for inviting me. Um, <laughs> should I go ahead and share my screen? Yeah, we can go into it. Okay. Uh, sorry. Can you see the screen fine? Um, feel free to interrupt whenever you have a question. <laughs> um, I don't think this will be like a super long presentation. Um, so, you know, lots of time for discussion, probably. This is still a work in progress. So um, any feedback you have would be <laughs> very much appreciated. Um, so I'll be talking today about the structural and functional contributions to response inhibition across the adult lifespan. And this is work that I'm doing with my two supervisors, Dr. Rosanna Olson and Cheryl Grady at um, U of T and the Rotman Research Institute in Toronto. Um, so cognitive control um, refers to the set of cognitive processes that allow us to regulate and engage in complex behaviors like planning, decision-making, problem-solving, creativity, and essentially they're what enable us to navigate in our environment on a day-to-day -day basis. And cognitive control is often broken down into domains of shifting, updating, and inhibition. So updating is kind of akin to working memory. This is the ability to update information you're holding in mind as you encounter new information in the environment. Shifting is the ability to switch between different tasks or rules while you're doing a task. And I'll get into inhibition shortly, but the main idea is that all of these domains, um, performance on tasks in these domains decline in older age. And um, this is shown here. So this is the effect size of age-related reductions in overall cognitive control or executive functions, as well as domain-specific age effects. And the largest effects are often seen in the domain of inhibition. Inhibition itself can be broken down into three components, depending on whose framework you subscribe to. But in this case, um, I'm showing the Friedman and Miyake framework where um, the three domains uh, are resistance to proactive interference. So suppressing information that was previously relevant, but is no longer relevant. Resistance to distractor interference. So your ability to ignore distraction in the environment and response inhibition. Response inhibition is the ability to withhold or override a dominant response or a habitual response in favor of a non-dominant one. And this is also something that tends to be reliably reduced in older adults compared to the other two types of inhibition. And like the gift that keeps on giving, you can also break down response inhibition into subcomponents like response interference. So your ability to resolve conflict between competing responses, like in the Stroop task, uh, action cancellation, so your ability to cancel an action that you've already started, um, which is measured with the stop signal task, oculomotor controls, or the ability to control your eye movements, and action restraint, which is the ability to withhold a response um, instead of sort of going, and this is measured with the go-no-go no go task. And the focus of my talk today will be on the action restraint um, aspect of response inhibition. <clears throat> In addition to cognition, um, aging is also associated with changes in the brain, including reductions in gray matter volume and cortical thickness, <clears throat> which tend to go down in age. Um, there are also changes in the microstructure of the white matter pathways that connect different brain regions. So for example, the integrity of these white matter pathways tends to go down with age. So this figure is showing FA, which is a measure of white matter integrity, um, and it's declining in older age, which suggests that white matter is becoming sort of less healthy as people get older. And this is shown in both cross-sectional and longitudinal studies of aging. In addition to these structural changes, functional activation patterns also differ between older and younger adults. So for example, um, in one study, older and younger adults did a task switching task. And what the authors found was that older adults tended to have greater activation of the insula and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in the right hemisphere. 
younger adults, um, particularly on these sort of cognitive control switching trials. And this was the case, even though task performance didn't differ between the two age groups. And in the literature, for the most part, when older adults show this pattern of overactivation, it's thought to be compensatory when their performance sort of matches that of younger adults. But when their performance isn't um, as good as younger adults' performance, it's thought to reflect sort of neural inefficiency or inefficient recruitment of neural resources. So they're trying to compensate, but they're unable to, um, which affects their task performance. But in either case, the question really is sort of what is the source or cause of this either neural inefficiency, or if it's a compensatory response, what is it compensating for? Um, and one explanation for frontal over recruitment that's kind of been um, proposed is this cortical disconnection hypothesis. Under this framework, these age-related uh, deteriorations in the microstructure of the white matter um, is thought to disrupt the timing and variability of neuronal signaling in the brain. Um, and one consequence of this can be functional over recruitment in some brain regions, which in turn can affect their behavioral performance. And it's been studied um, by sort of relating altered white matter microstructure to both functional activation and behavioral performance. Um, and some studies have shown that um, the association between age and functional activity is mediated by white matter microstructure. So in the test at task switching study I just talked about on the previous slide. Um, the age related um, association with brain activity in the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex was mediated by um, the white matter of the corpus callosum. And in another study also using task switching in a lifespan sample of adults, um, the authors looked at um, activity or activation of the default mode network. Here, they were looking at deactivation of the default mode network because it tends to be deactivated um, during a task. And older adults generally don't deactivate it to the same extent as younger adults. Um, and this sort of age-related association um, with this attenuated default mode deactivation was also mediated by FA of this default mode white matter. Um, so it seems that there is an association between age and brain activity that's related to or partly attributed to the microstructure of the white matter. So based on um, this, I wanted to, to sort of explore uh, whether the frontal parietal network, which is important for cognitive control, is involved in action restraint. So there are some studies out there looking at action restraint that have found that frontal and parietal regions are recruited during response inhibition in the go-no-go -go task. Um, and there are also subcortical areas like the subthalamic nucleus and the globus pallidus that are also activated. And in some cases, in one study that I found at least, older adults show greater activation in these frontal and parietal areas compared to younger adults. So this figure is showing sort of age-related increase in right inferior frontal gyrus activity um, during the go-no-go no, go, no, go task. Um, in other studies, the white matter microstructure uh, of tracts connecting these subcortical regions like the subthalamic nucleus with the inferior frontal gyrus have been associated with no-go accuracy as well, but this was done in younger adults. And what I found in my literature search is that very little work has been done on um, looking at age-related differences in functional activity and white matter microstructure using the go-no-go no go task and measuring action restraint. A lot of the work on response inhibition usually tends to use the stop signal task, uh, which measures action cancellation, which is a slightly different sort of process. So in this uh, work that I'll present today, one of the questions I asked was, um, do older adults show functional over-recruitment of the frontal parietal network while they're engaging in response inhibition, um, specifically action restraint? And if so, is this related to their white matter microstructure and task performance? Ultimately, though, um, we're also interested in studying how these neural variables contribute to behavior and cognition. And you'll see tons of studies in the literature on neurocognitive aging where they look at brain behavior associations. Um, and like I mentioned before, neural variables like white matter microstructure can mediate the association between age and functional recruitment. And 
you can sort of consider the associations between um, aging and brain behavior relationships um, in many different ways. So one way um, is to look at here A is age, B is brain. So this can be structure, function, and C is cognition. And one way to look at these relationships between the three things is by looking at brain variables as the mediator between the age behavior relationship. Or you can look at cognition as the mediator um, between the age brain relationship. This might be more relevant if you're running like a longitudinal or intervention study. Um, another possibility is that um, individual differences in brain and behavior are independently associated with age, um, but not necessarily with each other. So variation and sort of these neural variables is not really explaining variation in behavior, um, but they're both related to age. And lastly, it's possible that brain behavior associations in aging are driven by sort of these extraneous variables that maybe you didn't account for in your study, like cognitive reserve or genetic risk factors and so on. Um, but since I was mostly interested in understanding uh, or testing this cortical disconnection um, account, I will talk about um, sort of model one essentially, um, where these brain variables are um, mediating the association between age and cognition. Um, so to test that, just to give a sort of prelude to what I'll show later, um, I test a model in which um, white matter and brain activity are sort of mediators of the age response inhibition association. So the second research question is really sort of putting everything together. How do these um, white matter microstructural and or uh, functional activation patterns mediate the association between age and response inhibition um, on the go-no-go -go test specifically? Whoops, ignore this. <laughs> um, what I did was we had a fairly large sample of 154 adults aged 18 to 86 years old. Um, after exclusion, um, we had 145 adults, 87 of which of whom were females, and they completed the go-no-go -go task. So in this task, uh, participants are shown a stream of letters um, and instructed to press a button every time they saw the letter X and then withhold a response whenever they saw any other, other letter. And they had to withhold their response on 25% of the trials. So these were the no-go trials where they needed to um, engage in inhibition to withhold their response. And over here, I'm showing accuracy on the no-go trials and median reaction time on the go trials. On the left here, um, we have age on the x-axis, accuracy on the y-axis, female participants are plotted in purple, male participants in um, yellow, orange, and you can see that there's a pretty high accuracy rate, it's almost a ceiling effect, um, and there don't seem to be any associations with age, so, you know, older participants were just as good as younger participants. And there are also no sex differences here. Um, male participants perform just as well as female participants in withholding their response. Um, but when I looked at median reaction time on the GO trials, um, there was both an age and sex effect. So reaction times are slower um, in older adults compared to the younger adults. And um, female participants tended to be slower, so in purple, compared to male participants on average. And using these accuracy and reaction time measures, I computed a performance measure that was essentially this accuracy to speed ratio. Um, so dividing sort of mean no-go accuracy by median go reaction time. And here this kind of reflects the reaction time result where older adults tend to perform worse than younger adults and female participants tended to have lower performance than male participants. Um, and it's largely driven by these differences, sex and age differences in reaction time. Now, I was also interested in looking at sort of brain activity in the frontal parietal network while participants were doing this task in the scanner. And um, I looked at the contrast for no-go compared to go correct go trials um, in the frontal parietal network, specifically as defined by the Schaefer Atlas. So you can see the frontal parietal network regions in yellow here. All of, all of this was done in participants' native space. And on the right here, I just have a table showing the 
different ROIs that go into this network. Again, that's defined by the Schaefer um, parcellation. And I've just highlighted sort of these three regions um, that weren't represented bilaterally. So they're only sort of in one hemisphere. And the temporal ROI is like over here, it's in gray because <laughs> when I transformed sort of the mass to participants native space, it, it just, it was really bad um, and not a good fit. So uh, we just ended up excluding that region in our subsequent analyses. Next up, um, we also collected diffusion weighted imaging scans from our participants. So diffusion weighted imaging um, allows you to quantify sort of the direction and rate of water diffusion in the brain. Uh, and this diffusion of water or movement of water molecules can be isotropic. So this means that water is equally likely to diffuse in any direction, or it can be anisotropic. So um, water diffusion is restricted to one primary direction. Um, and in the brain, things like, or in the white matter in the brain specifically, things like cell membranes or axonal membranes, the presence of myelin, um, axon diameter, axon bundling can all constrain the um, movement of water molecules. And these um, can be quantified sort of with these or modeled with um, diffusion tensors, which model the degree of diffusion as well as the direction of water diffusion. So if you have sort of unrestricted water diffusion, um, when you model it and you get a diffusion ellipsoid, it'll look pretty circular or spherical because, again, water is equally likely to move in any direction. But if you're sort of looking at white matter in the brain, where water diffusion is constrained by the presence of these axonal membranes and axonal bundling, um, the water movement is anisotropic, so it's sort of restricted to one primary direction. And with D DTI or diffusion tensor um, imaging, you can obtain these summary metrics um, that kind of tell you um, the primary uh, direction of water diffusion, um, which is axial diffusivity. Um, and this is thought to be sensitive to axonal differences like the diameter of axons. You can also get a measure of the direction of um, water or the rate of water diffusion in the perpendicular direction. So this is called radial diffusivity or RD. So yeah, I was saying radial diffusivity is the perpendicular direction of diffusion to the primary direction. Um, and this is thought to be sensitive to myelination of the white matter. Mean diffusivity is sort of this average um, magnitude of diffusion independent of the direction. So if there's deterioration of neural barriers like axonal membranes or myelin sheets, you get an increase in MD. And then finally, anisotropy is or fractional anisotropy is the degree of directional restriction on water diffusion, which is a bit of a mouthful, but it's essentially to what extent is water diffusion restricted to one direction. So if you have a higher value, a value closer to one, it suggests that water is primarily moving in one direction, but if the value is closer or lower, then it suggests that water is sort of moving more isotropically. Um, and in the results that I'll present today, I'm primarily going to be using FA as the, or fractional anisotropy as the measure of white matter microstructure. With the diffusion weighted imaging scans, I use the software programs FSL and MR tricks to pre process the data and do tractography. Um, so I just pre processed it, um, created whole brain maps of the summary metrics, so FA, AD, RD, and MD um, that I talked about on the previous slide. Then I estimated the distribution of fiber orientations of, in each voxel. So uh, instead of getting sort of just one direction of water diffusion in each voxel, this kind of gives you like a more probabilistic um, distribution in, of water diffusion. So this is showing the corpus callosum um, as an example. And here you can see that the primary direction is pretty um, constrained to one direction, but in other voxels, you can see that there's smaller um, ellipsoids and um, you can see sort of multiple ellipsoids kind of going in different directions. And it's just a more probabilistic means of modeling which direction water is moving in in these voxels. Um, I also created sort of a map of the gray matter, white matter boundary to make sure that the tractography that I subsequently do is anatomically constrained. So here you can see in orange, the 
gray matter, white matter interface or boundary. And this just ensures that when you start tractography, the seeding or the start of each streamline is only happening from the white matter, not from like the deep gray matter. And then finally performed whole brain probabilistic tractography, generated about 10 million streamlines and then applied filtering um, using SIFT, um, which selectively filters out streamlines that may be subject to reconstruction biases and like previous processing steps. Um, and essentially the point of that is to filter out any false positive streamlines that you might get because it's a pretty common issue with probabilistic tractography. Um, so I got the whole brain tracted around that way. And again, all of this was done in native space. And using that tractogram, um, I created a structural connectome using the same Schaefer atlas that I talked about before. Um, so here the spheres represent the different regions or nodes of that atlas. And these lines or edges represent the streamlines connecting them based on the tractography output. And then I just isolated the uh, nodes representing the front of parietal network, um, as well as the streamlines connecting them and then converted them to like a binary image. Um, and use that as the mass to extract the white matter metrics from those FA, MD, RD, AD maps that I generated earlier. And with these, the first thing I looked at was, okay, how do these measures of white matter microstructure relate to age? And replicating a lot of what's been shown in the literature, what we found was that fractional anisotropy sort of went down with age. So all of these measures showed a quadratic relationship with age. Fractional anisotropy was pretty much stable until like the 40s before it started to go down. Whereas the diffusivity has continued to go down, lower values indicate healthier white matter. But then around like the middle ages, around 45, 50, it started to go up reflecting sort of these um, alterations to white matter microstructure in the older adults in our sample. Next, um, I wanted to look specifically now at um, age differences in front of parietal recruitment while participants were doing this go, no go task. Um, and I looked at this as a function of performance of white matter, FA, hemisphere, and age. And I also included uh, demographic variables like participant sex, um, years of education, number of languages they speak, and um, MOCA scores. So MOCA is a neuropsychological assessment of cognitive status, um, which is sometimes used as um, a screener for potential MCI or dementia. So I included these as covariates um, because they may or may not be proxies of cognitive reserve, which I'll sort of talk about later in the discussion. And first thing I just want to talk about is the age effect. So contrary to what we predicted, there was no main effect of age. We didn't see any evidence of age-related functional over-recruitment. Um, so this is not significant. What we did see was a main effect of performance and participant sex. Um, so here, old, better performers tended to show greater frontal parietal recruitment compared to worse performers on this task and female participants showed greater recruitment of the frontal parietal network than the male participant and this was interesting because if you remember earlier when i showed the behavioral results female participants performed worse on this task than the male participants yet they were showing greater functional recruitment which high performers also showed um, which kind of made me wonder if there was this interaction going on between sex and performance. So I followed up on this pretty much same model, but I included an interaction term between sex and performance to see um, if there was an interaction taking place. And there was. Um, so there was an interaction between participant sex and task performance in predicting frontal parietal activity. And what I found by doing a simple slopes analysis was that um, female participants, like you saw earlier, tended to have greater frontal parietal recruitment than male participants. But in the male group, better performers showed greater activity, but better female performers didn't show greater activity than worse female performers. And this was kind of unexpected going into this. I wasn't expecting any sex differences. And this is not a sort of literature that I'm very familiar with. Um, so I'm just now starting to dive into it. But if you have any thoughts or ideas about 
what might be going on or any feedback, please, please speak up <laughs> either now or later um, because yeah, this was unexpected. In addition, um, we also saw an interaction between age and hemisphere. So um, the pattern of sort of age-related functional recruitment um, differed between the left and right hemispheres. And um, according to like a simple slopes analysis, this association was not significantly different from zero in the left hemisphere, but in the right hemisphere, there was a marginal uh, association between age and old, suggesting that older adults may be over recruiting um, the right frontal parietal areas compared to younger adults. Uh, we might be overpowered to detect an effect, I'm not sure, but the trend certainly seems to be in the direction that you'd expect based on sort of past work um, on this. So just to summarize um, what we saw from the first a set of analyses um, looking at frontal parietal recruitment is that it doesn't seem to be directly related to age. Um, there does seem to be a differential pattern of recruitment in older adults um, between the left and right cerebral hemispheres, um, but the simple slopes only showed a marginal association. So um, interpret that with caution because we're certainly not dwelling on that too much. Um, we also saw greater functional activation in our female participants compared to our male participants, but the interaction between sex and performance was only present among the male participants who tended to show greater activity in this network when they were also performing well, or only high performers showed greater activity in this network, I should say. And contrary to what you'd expect from, you know, like a cortical disconnection um, framework, um, frontal parietal activation was not related to white matter at all, or at least not to FA in this network, um, in our data at least. So if anyone has any questions, I can just pause here for a second. Um, oh, just quick clarification. So here, when you mm -hmm. have performance, this is on your measure that takes the accuracy divided by reaction time. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, I mean, my first thought was that, well, thinking back to those those results like the accuracy didn't differ between sex right it was only reaction time so yeah supposedly then like this result is driven by the reaction time difference between the, between the sexes so i don't know yeah I'm, I'm trying to think about you know what, what it could be but you know when you think of, of of frontal areas you know we think of like impulse control and this is a go no go task so maybe something along those lines but yeah it's a, it, a very interesting result that yeah i simply would not have expected yeah, yeah. The reason I use the performance metric instead of either accuracy or reaction time is because the reaction time is coming from go trials. It's not something you can really measure with no go trials. But you also want to account for sort of performance or account for the variation in no go responses, right? If you're looking at inhibition related activity. Um, so it didn't really make total sense to only look at accuracy or to only look at reaction time. But yeah, it's 100% driven by the reaction time differences between sexes and age. Yeah. Do you know, um, like in general, or in, in like just general reaction time findings, do the, is there a, a broad known gender difference that men are faster in general? Because I, I wasn't aware if there is one. I wasn't either. I've only come across like three or four studies on sex differences in the go no go task um in one of them female participants were actually performing better than male participants and in the other two there were no sex differences so it's pretty it's relatively underexplored i would say also because a lot of the response inhibition studies use a stop signal task um and not the go no go so I've been struggling to like contextualize what we found with the broader literature, because I don't want to equate it to stop signal performance of response inhibition, because they're not exactly the same. Um, right. Yeah, very puzzling. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we don't quite know what to make of it yet, but I hope to have an answer uh, in the next coming weeks. It's interesting just kind of seeing not the same problems I'm kind of running into, but just similar results because one of the tasks I'm doing is like an executive functioning task, it's, but it's spatial working memory. And so we've got accuracy, which pretty much hits ceiling, this reaction time difference. And it's also like, so are the people who have like for hard and easy trials, if they have the same reaction time, like are they even doing the game correctly? Because like you'd think you'd have a longer reaction time. So it's just interesting. How do you interpret these behavioral metrics, which seem so straightforward? 
and then you get into like trying to talk about it in the discussion and it sounds like you're having kind of similar like what does this actually mean though about behavior exactly yeah a lot of it is just like <laughs> I don't know I don't know yet um there's this other study that I'm involved in where we're having the same issue where reaction time is going down on the harder trials compared to like the medium like yeah. difficulty trials and yeah I don't know what to make of that either because yeah our interpretation is that they're not like they've given up um yeah. yeah so now we're like taking a closer look at accuracy proportions of like non-responses versus correct and incorrect to try and figure out like what's different about these it's mm -hmm. kids but it's like is it that they're better so they don't need extra time on harder or is it that they've given up which are two obviously very different uh interpretations of the exact same data yeah yeah so we're definitely. looking closer to try and <laughs> untangle that <laughs> i know i wish we'd collected something like a measure of i don't know like working memory capacity or some other like trade like um measure so we could relate it to like baseline or you know trade um, characteristics of the participants. Yeah, oh, yeah. puzzling. <laughs> um, right, so switch. I don't oh. know. I was just say I don't know if this will exactly be helpful, but there's mm -hmm. one task I'm aware of that's similar to like a traditional go no go, mm -hmm. um, but it's like sustained attention where like the images gradually transform from one to another, um, the gradual continuous performance, and I just looked to see if they had a paper on sex differences, and they do. Ooh, so okay. I haven't read it, but I sent it in the chat, and maybe that will be a help. Amazing. Thank you. I'll open it yeah, no after I finish. <laughs> Appreciate that. Any other questions before I move on? Almost done. Okay, so I'll switch gears a little bit and talk about the path analysis that I uh, briefly mentioned earlier. So here I just kind of threw everything into a model um, to look at the interrelationships between, you know, age and these brain measures and performance on the go-no-go no go task. And what I wanted to look at specifically was the potentially mediating effect of um, white matter FA and or gold on the association between age and performance. So I had three mediations in this model. So one was just the mediating effect of FA. So this would be like the AF interaction. The other was the mediating effect of gold, so the DE interaction. And finally, the mediating effects of FA and Bull, so the ABE interaction. And then I had, you know, the usual covariates um, as predictors of both the brain measures and the go-no-go no go task performance. Um, so in terms of the direct effects, the pattern was very similar to what I showed in the regression. So older adults tended to have worse performance, lower FA, um, and here age wasn't related to brain activity because I just took a summary sort of mean contrast estimate across all ROIs and hemispheres and uh, or both hemispheres, there are only two. Um, and if you remember the interaction between the left and right hemisphere was like a crossover. So it's possible that it got kind of canceled out. Um, and that's why we don't see an age effect here. And then FA was like marginally associated with task performance. So individuals with higher white matter FA tended to be better performers, but again, interpret with caution. And brain activity was positively related to go-no-go -go performance. FA was not related to brain activity, again, um, consistent with the regression. Then turning to the, uh, oh, oh yeah, and then for the covariates, kind of similar to what we saw, male participants were better performers and had lower activity than female participants. So none of this is really that new. Um, in terms of the indirect effects, though, um, there was a marginal um, indirect effect of FA on the age go-no-go -no -go association, um, which may be because the direct effect of FA was also marginal. Um, and overall, what I'm learning from this is I feel like we're massively underpowered to detect any effects if they're there, um, even with our sample size. But essentially, from what, what I gather from this at least is that this age-related reduction in performance, which is again, mostly driven by slower RT or reaction time is maybe partly attributed to age-related reductions in the integrity of the white matter of the frontal parietal network. The indirect effects of brain activity <clears throat> were not significant, obviously because the main direct effect was not 
there and this joint indirect effect of FA and brain activity were also not significant. Um, so just to summarize sort of our task performance um, findings, um, most of the results from this path analysis largely mirrored the pattern I showed in the regression where older adults and um, female participants tended to show worse performance and um, better performers tended to have greater activity. And there may potentially be sort of this um, association of task performance and age with white matter in the frontal parietal network because there was this marginal direct effect and um, mediating effect of FA. Um, so yeah, these are the analyses that I've done so far. It's definitely a work in progress, um, but the main takeaways um, from this and what I've really been thinking about what our findings mean is that it may be important to consider the role of other behavioral and neural variables in how they modulate task-related activity. So a lot of variables go into um, or influence the bold signal that we record, um, including sort of structural measures like gray matter volume, presence of pathology like white matter hyperintensities or amyloid beta deposits, neurotransmitters, um, just to name a few. And in the work I talked about just now, I was focused more on this cortical disconnection framework, which is why I mostly looked at the contribution of white matter microstructure, which doesn't seem to uh, contribute to frontal parietal recruitment. But in addition to these other neural variables, um, which we didn't measure, um, there are also demographic variables that might be important to consider um, because they may index cognitive reserve, um, particularly sex, because we saw sex differences in both performance and functional activation during the go-no-go -no -go task. Um, and this was, I feel like a fairly large sample compared to some other studies that I've read on the topic. Um, and it's um, relating it to like previous work, like I said before, I haven't come across many studies looking at sex differences in go-no-go no -go performance that also used fMRI, um, but it might be something that I think we should consider moving forward. Um, particularly in studies of neurocognitive aging, because we know that there are um, estradiol receptors in different brain regions like the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex um, and different levels of estrogen sort of circulating in the brain might affect um, dopaminergic transmission and task performance. Um, so in one study that looked at sex differences, a lot of studies I saw um, were rodent studies, but in one sort of human study, um, the authors had women do um, a working memory task, um, and they found that women with low baseline levels of estradiol, um, based on like the genes they had for like the comp gene, um, those with sort of lower baseline levels of estradiol had better working memory performance when they were in the late follicular or early luteal phase of their menstrual cycle, when estrogen levels are high. Um, and it suggests that, you know, increases in estrogen might sort of facilitate dopaminergic transmission. That may be important for a task like the go-no-go, -no -go, at least, because it relies on some sub subcortical structures that are involved in dopaminergic neurotransmission. And in terms of aging, um, we know that, you know, postmenopausal individuals with low estrogen levels um, might show sort of a differential association with functional activation um, compared to like younger individuals who are not, who are premenopausal. Um, so there might be an interaction with lower estrogen levels in older age. So just some things that I'm, I've been thinking about, again, would love some feedback on this because um, this is a fairly new area for me um, and I'm still sort of reading through what's out there. Um, but in addition to sort of functional recruitment. Um, I've also been thinking about how it's important to consider all of those variables also in understanding task performance, because at the end of the day, um, I care about sort of behavior and cognition, and I wanna understand how our brain helps us um, get through day-to-day -day life, um, do all of these tasks. And in addition to some of the um, factors that I already talked about, I think, um, 
I, in terms of next steps, I think I'm gonna also look at brain activity and the white matter in um, regions that sort of make up this core response inhibition network, which includes the inferior frontal gyrus, subthalamic nucleus, and the free supplementary motor area. Um, and a lot of work on response inhibition has been done on that, but using the stop signal test. So I want to sort of extend those findings to see if they also generalize to action restraint um, using the go no go test as well. Um, and yeah, that's it for me. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you for inviting me. And um, just want to shout out to my supervisors and my labs. And yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shereen. That was wonderful. Um, yeah, open up the floor. Any questions, comments, suggestions, or solutions to some of these puzzling or findings? Just rambling thoughts. <laughs> I'm open to everything. <laughs> yeah, I think the most the most obvious one would be to see if you can find that sort of uh, gender interaction if you split up your participant into like premenopausal age and postmenopausal age, right? If that might be one of the things that you suspect is going on. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking of looking at like a gender age interaction um, as it pertains to like functional recruitment and performance, but I haven't figured out how to specify that model exactly yet. Um, question. So when you did your interaction with sex and the thing that I don't remember that it interacted with, um, did you, yeah, can you go to the equations? Did you keep the main effects of sex in there as well? Or yeah. did you just do the interaction part? Okay. Yeah. I assume so. I just wasn't sure. Yeah, definitely. I was like, maybe that would help, but no, that's simple and you got it. <laughs> <laughs> Any other? Final thoughts, Shereen, you, I think you mentioned uh, through our email conversation that this is some work in progress. Um, mm -hmm. So, are you are you like just collecting more participants on the same uh, for the same data set, or are you are you looking to expand to, to sort of new ideas to combine with this? Mm -hmm. I think I want to look at I want to look at the response inhibition regions first um, because they're more traditionally studied when people look at action cancellation or action restraint. Um, Frontoparietal is more um, associated with like the task switching, working memory type cognitive control tasks, not so much response inhibition tasks. But um, one of the things I was curious about is do, does that pattern generalize to all domains of cognitive control? Um, and then it doesn't really seem to be, but <laughs> um, now I wanna see if the work that's out there on action cancellation, um, will also generalize to action restraint. Um, Cause I, in my head, there are very categorically different types of inhibition. Um, and yeah, it's just something to explore next. I don't know how much, how far I'll go with the sex differences. Um, I feel like it's a fairly nascent sort of area as it pertains to neurocognitive aging at least. Um, in healthy aging. I know there's been work on like dementia, sex differences in dementia where women tend to be more at risk, but in healthy aging, there doesn't seem to be as much. Um, so that's something I'm still very new to. All right, well, I mean, this was wonderful. Um, there are no final questions. We'll thank that's Shireen one last time. This was great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for a great talk. Thanks. And thank you for sharing the article. Um,